Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the first presentation in the 2023-2024 Jepson Leadership Forum Speaker Series, Masculinity in a Changing World. I'm Sandra Peart. I'm Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to, the, to tonight's event. I'm pleased to welcome University of Richmond President Kevin Halleck and members of the university's board of trustees who have joined us in Quili the Queeley Center this evening. Welcome as well to those of you who are live streaming tonight's event. I know there are many of you online. And a special shout out to our students, including those from St. Christopher's. Welcome. Yes. The last few decades have seen rapid changes in gender relations and norms in the household, the workplace, and in government. This year, we've invited forum speakers to discuss masculinity in the context of these cultural shifts. Specific topics include the role of hormones in gender identity and behavior, status competition and violence, the challenges facing men as a result of the changing nature of the family and the economy, black masculinity in the United States, and the past and the future of patriarchy globally. The response we've seen to this series has been overwhelming. It appears to be a long overdue topic of discussion. I'd like to thank Jepson faculty members, Chris Von Ruden and Jess Flanagan, for their leadership in proposing this topic and bringing suggestions to the Jepson School faculty. In keeping with our custom of selecting a leadership studies student to interview and introduce the speaker, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Carter Pete. Carter is a senior. He's double majoring in leadership studies and environmental studies with interests in public policy. This past summer, he completed his Jepson internship at the University of Maryland School of Public Health, where he focused on the intersection of environmental justice and health. The Rochester, New York native is president of both the men's club volleyball team and the sport club council. He's also a member of the Jepson School's Science Leadership Scholars Program. Please join me in welcoming Carter Pete, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you, Dean Peart, for introducing me. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's featured speaker. Richard Reeves is president of the American Institute of Boys and Men, an organization with a mission to raise awareness for the problems of boys and men and advocate for effective solutions. His 2022 book of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It, was heralded as a landmark by the New York Times and named a book of the year by both The Economist and The New Yorker. Prior to leading the American Institute for Boys and Men this June, Dr. Reeves was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, DC, where he directed the Future of the Middle Class Initiative and the Center on, excuse me, the Center on Children and Families. He writes for a wide range of publications, including The New York Times, The Guardian, National Affairs, The Atlantic, Democracy Journal, and The Wall Street Journal. After the publication of his critically acclaimed 2017 book, Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, Politico magazine named him one of the top 50 thinkers in the US. A Brit American, Dr. Reeves was director of strategy to the UK's deputy prime minister from 2010 to 2012. Other previous roles include the director of the London-based political think tank Demos, social affairs editor of The Observer, principal policy advisor to the UK's minister for welfare reform, and research fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research. He's also a former European Business Speaker of the Year and earned a BA from Oxford, Oxford University and a PhD from Warwick University. We just had an excellent dinner, and he has a lot of great things to share with you all tonight. So please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Richard Reeves to the stage. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.
Thank you, Carter. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you to Chris and Jess, and also to Shannon, who's done so much work behind the scenes to, to make this happen. It's an honor to be here. And you always say that when you give a speech like this. It's an honor to be here. It's almost like a reflex. But when I see how many of you are here, and I know how many are watching online, and when I see what you have in store for you in this series, it really is an honor. I am delighted that you've chosen this subject uh, to tackle. And I am delighted and astonished by the range of speakers that you have in this series to come. So congratulations on getting all those speakers, because it really, I mean, I was, we were discussing it in a, a call before. And I was like, wait, who? You've got Carol? Wait, you've got Charles? Wait, <laughs> really? So I, I strongly encourage all of you to attend as many of them as you can. And, and honestly, if I had my way, I'd want to listen to all of them. Too. So as Carter's introduction kind of illuminated a little bit, I'm not from here originally. So I have to do a little bit of level setting here. If you hear something odd in the way I'm talking, it is because I am from East Tennessee. <laughs> I actually am from East Tennessee. Uh, now, having spent many years in DC and before that in various policy jobs in, in government uh, uh, in the UK and in think tanks. And I've worked on class gaps. I've worked on intergenerational mobility. I've worked quite a bit on race. I've worked on the middle class in both the UK and in the US. And now I'm working on the issues of boys and men. This is not where I expected to be. And it is not where many of my colleagues thought I should go. I open the book by explaining that many of my colleagues warned me against this subject area. You'd heard I'd written Dream Hoarders, I'd done stuff on class, I was reasonably well established at the Brookings Institution, and the Brookings Institution is an amazing place that I remain affiliated with. It's like a medieval sinecure in many ways. You know, it's like how, you couldn't make that job up, it's so amazing, the chance to work with those people and do that work. But I decided to leave the Brookings Institution following my book and create the American Institute for Boys and Men. It's actually the first time that I've presented with slides that are made up with our logo on it. So you are the first audience ever to see this logo for the American Institute for Boys and Men. And I was doing it like the night before last, kind of late, and I couldn't get it to work, and I was cursing the new format. But so I hope it works. And that was after this writing this book that I was warned against. Why, why would you not talk about boys and men? And the answer is because right now, the debate about sex and gender has become so painfully polarized that you're forced to choose to take sides. To be concerned about any of the issues for our boys and men is to imply that you're not concerned about the ongoing issues facing girls and women. At worst, raising the problems of boys and men might be seen as somehow anti women, anti-girls and women, were still to be somehow blaming the women's movement or women for the plight of the modern male. All of that is wrong and dangerous. If it's framed as zero sum, and it's either a war on men or a war on women, and you have to care about one or the other, then we're in real trouble. Zero sum thinking is the enemy of progress. Anybody who says that to care about and draw attention to the problems of boys and men is to distract from or diminish the concerns we should have for women and girls is like someone saying to a parent of a boy and a girl, which one are you allowed to care about? You're allowed to care about one of them, but you're not allowed to care about both. And unfortunately, the mere fact of raising these issues means that you're in that space, right? Hence the warnings. But I've come to believe that this is too important an issue for us to be silent on, for us to censor ourselves on, for us to be cowardly about, frankly. And if a Brookings scholar that sounds like me and has the charts I'm about to force upon you isn't allowed to talk about boys and men, who is and who will? Because someone will. We might not like their answers to the problems of masculinity in a changing world. 
So I'd like you to treat some of what I'm about to say today as sort of a, a prelude to some of what you're about to hear later in the series, and I'm really excited to get into the Q&A as well. But as I say, I'm just going to do a little bit of motivation here first, which is why this subject? And I've said a little bit about this already, but let me personalize it a little bit too. I started off looking at the literature on boys and men, starting with Hannah Rosen's book, some of the work before that. Hannah Rosen wrote this book 10 years ago now, after her Atlantic essay. It's not like this is a new thing. Kay Heimowitz had her book, Manning Up, more from a slightly more conservative perspective. Phil Zimbardo and Nikita Coulomb had their book, uh, which was also very good. Man Out, Andrew Yarrow, from the Brookings Institution Press, which is the press I published with. Right? So book on the same subject from the same press within a few years of each other. Right? What are you doing, Reeves, was the question. The Boy Crisis from Warren Farrell and John Gray. And even since my book has come out, there's been more, including this from Senator Josh Hawley. Manhood, the masculine virtues America needs. And Senator Hawley has some criticisms of my work, which we might be able to get into. But the point being is there's plenty of discussion about this. It's not like we don't have books or articles about it. So why on earth put another one out into the market? Do we really need another book? And there are a number of reasons why I decided that I was going to write this book, and now, subsequently, as a result of the, partly, the response to the book, to launch the first ever think tank in the US looking at the issues of boys and men. The first and only think tank looking at the issues of boys and men. I'm all in now. As a friend of mine said, well, you're out on this limb now, so you may as well see you there and stay there and see how long it takes before you get sawn off. We'll see. Well, here's one answer, and I don't know if my son snuck into the back of this room or not because we're in transit right now, so he's traveling with me. Uh, he's my middle son on the right, but these are my three boys, 27, 23, and 22. I hope that's right. It changes all the time. <laughs> so I said it really quickly, uh, and I've raised them in the UK and the US, and so honestly, part of it has been a discussion about their experience of the education systems and culture and dating and what's happening. So that was happening on the, on the personal side. But then professionally, I'm at the Brookings Institution in my office, reading evaluation papers of policy interventions, looking at the latest data on graduation rates, et cetera. You know, that's, it's a living. Someone has to do it, just going through evaluation papers. And it just kept stumbling over these statistics about the ways in which boys and men especially working class boys and men and boys and men of color, just really weren't doing very well. There were lots of gender gaps that kept going the other way to the way that I was predisposed to look for them. Uh, and it came to the point where I would be going, running around saying to my colleagues, did you know this? Did you know this? For example, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, male college enrollment dropped seven times faster than female college enrollment. That was in table two of whatever it was, appendix from the NCES. I'm like, wait, what? I'm running around, all my colleagues who were connected, did you know this? Did you know this? No. And it was for all kinds of interesting reasons, which we could get into. But nonetheless, the fact wasn't there. At the same time, I noticed that men were dying from COVID in much higher numbers. Among prime age, 25 to 54, twice as many men as women died in the pandemic. Globally, a 50% higher death rate. And again, I'd running around, did you know this? Did you know this? And not enough people knew it, or if they did know it, I didn't think we were having a good conversation about it, because if you talked about it, you ran the risk of being branded as someone who was somehow anti-women. So that's why I stepped forward, and partly it's because of them. But it's also because of C.P. Scott, who was the uh, founder of the Guardian newspaper who, that I worked for for many years, who said, this comment is free, but facts are sacred. There's a lot of comment about this, but we've got to get our facts straight. Sometimes those facts are inconvenient or difficult, but nonetheless, let's try and have this conversation on the basis of the best facts we could find. And so I felt like I could do some work just laying out the facts, which I'm about to do some of that work with you now. And the last reason, was because I felt like as someone that works on public policy, I wanted solutions. I wanted ideas about how we could actually address these problems. Many of the books, including even some of the ones that I admire that I mentioned earlier, 
were the secular equivalent of the Book of Lamentations. There's been an awful lot of lamenting what's happening to boys and men, some, and sometimes in ways that are unhelpful, that are quite pathologizing, like the eye-rolling version, right? the why can't you be more like your sister version. But just generally, there's been a lot of analysis and a lot of lamentation and not much solution. And I'm a policy wonk, right? It's what we do, come up with solutions. And so I do have some solutions that we will get into and try and move the debate on past just the, oh, that's interesting, there's a big gap, and then move on. Instead, let's say, well, what could we do about it? If we had the will, which is a different question, but if we were willing to do stuff to address those problems, what would that stuff be? And so I felt I could add a contribution there. So that's the spirit of my talk. I'm going to start with some very stark facts. The suicide rate. Deaths from suicide by gender and age. The headline fact here is that four times as many men lose their life to suicide as women. That is true at every age range. The fastest rise since 2019, 1999, I'm sorry, and 2021 on the right, has actually been among young men from 15 to 24, but the highest rates remain among middle-aged men. The gap of the fourfold gender gap is similar in most countries. The rise is higher in the US, and that's for all kinds of reasons. And suicide is just one example of what's being called de a death of despair. This is Anne Case and Angus Deaton's work on deaths of despair that includes deaths from suicide, but also from drug overdoses and from alcohol-related deaths. The opioid crisis has hit men significantly harder than it has women. You wrap all that together. And actually, overall, men are three times higher risk of a death of despair than, than women. And as you can see, the suicide rates are quite stark and quite different. And, and again, this isn't really discussed, I think, enough. And it in no way should distract us from the real issues that we have with teen girl mental health. Those are very profound, but different in their expression. And our policy should accept that. But behind that very stark statistic lies a whole range of others. I'm not going to have time to do all of them today. And I'm conscious of the interest of some of the people in the audience and the need to get to Q&A. So I'll start with education, since we're an educational institution. And I'll do this relatively quickly. This chart shows you for every 100 men how many women were getting either a four-year college degree or a postgraduate degree, four-year in orange, postgraduate degree in blue from 1971-72 academic year through to roughly the present day. The lines haven't changed much since, if anything, dipped a little bit. And what that shows you is that in 1971-72, there was a pretty big gender gap in the share of college degrees in favor of men. There is now a slightly bigger gender gap in college degrees, but the other way around. 1972 is an interesting year because it's when we passed Title IX, a landmark piece of legislation to promote women's educational opportunities in various ways. So it's important to note that the percentage point gaps are about 13 points then in favor of men and about 15 points now in favor of women, depending on how you measure it. But the basic message here is that we have slightly bigger gender gaps in higher education today than when we passed Title IX in 1972, but they're the other way around. Why is that? Well, a lot of this can be predicted by what happens in high school. So here, I've taken high school GPAs, ranked them from lowest on the left to highest on the right by decile, so 10% 10, 10 10% of the whole distribution. And what this tells you is on the right-hand side, this is the top 10% of high school students, so the kinds of students that selective institutions of higher education are drawing from, and you can see that two-thirds of them are girls. Two-thirds of those at the bottom are boys with a pretty linear relationship in between. Interestingly, no real gender gap on standardized tests. ACT, SAT, not much to see there anymore. One consequence of that difference in the huge gender skew of GPA in favor of girls and pretty flat on standardized tests is that when institutions of higher education go test optional, have you gone test optional? When institutions of higher education go test optional, 
the median result is to increase the female share by four percentage points. Doesn't change much else in terms of representation, but it significantly increases the female share, which makes sense. The only, the only arena coming out of high school where boys are holding level with girls is standardized tests. On every other measure, the girls are ahead. On a GPA, streets ahead. Right? I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do because GPA predicts college completion significantly more than SAT or ACT. But the other point to make here is that there's no big difference by gender in terms of how smart girls or boys are. Boys are not smarter than girls and girls are not smarter than boys. But girls get their acts together earlier than boys. And I'll have a bit more to say about that in a moment. And that really shows up in GPA, right? And I'll say a bit more about that in a second, but high school. This is the catch up chart, right? So what this chart shows you, and this is from Larry Steinberg um, and his colleagues' work, um, Elizabeth Shulman, Larry Steinberg, and Catherine Page Harden uh, paper, which shows you the average score on a couple of measures for girls and boys by age. Right? So what you're seeing here is impulse control and sensation seeking. The orange line is sensation seeking, which the psychologists refer to as like the gas in a car. And then impulse control, which is like the brake in the car. Sensation seeking is a bit of your brain that says, that's a great idea, let's try that. <laughs> sensation seeking is what's happening in a young man's brain when he says to his friend, here, hold my drink and watch this. <laughs> One of the most terrifying sentences for any parent to overhear. <laughs> that's that bit. But then the break is like, ah, maybe that's not such a great idea. Maybe I shouldn't take that drug. Maybe I shouldn't take that risk. Maybe I should stay home. I've got a test tomorrow. I should study for it. I should stay home, etc. Right. And all of, our, our, all of our lives are about that relationship between gas and brake, right? If we're all brake, my God, we're boring. But if we're all gas, we're a little bit out of control, right? So adolescence, as you can see, is a bit of a period where there's sensation-seeking spikes, all kinds of hormonal reasons for that. Carol Hooven, whose book on testosterone you're going to hear about, will, I'm sure, be a good person to talk to about this. Um, so t adolescence is a period where a little bit too much gas, not enough brake, but look at the difference between girls and boys. Right? For girls, it's just this brief period where, yeah, a bit too much gas, not quite enough break. For boys, it's like, oh, gas! Where's the break? Right? And then it catches up. Well, it doesn't actually ever quite catch up, if we're honest, as you can see from the chart. But the point I want to draw attention to here is that look at these critical years in here, 14 through 18, 14 through 18. And the point about the impulse control bit, that's what I call, what social scientists call non-cognitive skills. Cognitive is about smarts, non-cognitive is about these organizational skills. I call them chemistry homework skills. Complete, any, chem, any chemistry professors in the audience? Anybody? Just offending anybody? Okay, sorry. Um, right, doing your chemistry homework. What do you have to do? You have to be in the chemistry class when it's assigned. You have to be paying attention. You have to make a note of it. You have to remember later that you've got it. You have to actually do it. And let's be honest, it's chemistry homework. No one wants to do it. You've then got to turn it in. I've lost count of how many, how many uh, there isn't a 15 year old boy in the world that can do that without help. Or if you still don't believe me, go into the classroom of like, I don't know, ninth graders, eighth graders, and just ask them all to open up their book bags. On average, can't emphasize that enough, the girls' binders will be relatively well organized, you're relatively neat and tidy, etc. On average, the boys' book bags will be like a controlled explosion. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. But it's not the boys' fault. Sometimes I'm accused of saying, ah, oh, Reeve says it's all the boys. No, it's just, it's just neuroscience. And by the way, the main reason for that is that girls hit puberty a year earlier than boys, and puberty is what seems to trigger the development of the frontal cortex, which is the, bit of the, chemi which is the chemistry homework bit. Right? So the education system in that sense it's just a little bit more structured in a way that really rewards the frontal cortex and the chemistry homework skills in the very years where the boys are struggling most. Hence the GPA gap, which then predicts what happens later. But it's very important as we do this work, and I'm going to do this a couple of times, and here I'm anticipating, I think of what some, what some of Charles will talk to you, Charles Blow will talk to you about, around the specific issues of race. 
there's this term intersectionality, which despite being horrifically ugly is quite useful. And what it basically means is that when we're looking at class, we should also look at race. When we're looking at race, we should look at gender. We should look at how they intersect. And here, what you're seeing is that for black Americans, you're seeing much, much bigger gaps in education than for other groups. Here, I've just compared to white. So here you're seeing of the degrees that are conferred to black and white Americans, what share go to women and men. And you can see that at every level, for every black man getting a college degree, there are two black women. Now, that's the trend generally, but for black Americans, already there. That's also true in high school graduation rates and many other areas. As a rule of thumb, if you take a gender gap in any area of education, you can assume it'll be twice that between black boys and black girls, or black men and black women. And so as we're thinking about which boys and men are struggling the most, it's very important to keep that in mind. Now, on the suicide rate statistics I showed earlier, I, I'm not showing the, ra the race breakdown here, it's actually working class, middle-aged white men who are at most a risk of suicide or a death of despair. So the intersectionality cuts different ways, depending on the question at hand. But it should be an empirical question, not a political question. If we think we know the answer already, we're not doing very good work, are we? Like in Washington DC and in London, there's this real buzz phrase where we're gonna have evidence-based policy making. That's what we're gonna have, evidence-based policy making. What we usually get, policy-based evidence making. <laughs> I'm invested in this policy, you better find me some evidence it's working. And you always can, you always can. It's just very often really bad evidence that unless you know what you're doing, it's easy to assume is okay. Or even prejudice-based evidence making. Give me an opinion on something and I'm pretty sure that pretty quickly with the right support, I could come up with a chart that supports that view. I just have to select the data in the right way. And the chart won't necessarily be wrong, but it will be misleading. You know when you give a, an oath when you do jury service or when you're giving testimony or you're a witness in a trial, you say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Where people slip up in academic work, in scholarship, in all of this advocacy is the middle one. Usually, people are too smart to say something that's wrong. What they do is they just miss the other bits. They just miss the bits of evidence that don't support their thesis or that go against it, or that speak to other groups. We don't tell the whole truth. That's what I aim to do in the New Institute, is try and tell the whole truth. But, so they're seeing intersect. What else is happening in education? Well, one thing that's happening is fewer and fewer men in 1980 in our, in our classrooms. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan first came to office, 33% of K-12 teachers were male. Today, it's 23%. And falling. And every year, the NCES puts out a new stat Fewer men, fewer men, fewer men, and every year no one pays any attention. I think we're at a borderline crisis point where we're at 23% because the evidence is that once a profession becomes very strongly gender segregated, it gets harder to persuade people from the other gender to go into it. We've learned a lot from the women into STEM movement. It is really hard to persuade women to be engineers when they're going to be the one female engineer in their class or the, of the two. The same is true the other way around in education. Once we're at 23%, and my son, who was in that picture, who's a teacher and aspires to be a teacher, will tell you that there's a certain amount of stigma that goes along with that now, as a man. It is harder than it used to be, which means fewer men will do it, which means fewer men will do it. So I think we're at borderline crisis levels in the share of male teachers. And that's particularly true in the earlier years. The biggest drop has actually been in high school. Over here in post-secondary universities now, we're at close to gender parity, extraordinary progress in a higher education towards gender parity. That's on the right-hand side. But as you can see, the share of men, which is the dark, uh, the dark uh, bar at the top, is very low, especially in the early years. There are basically almost no men in kindergarten or early years. Two to three percent of kindergarten teachers are male. As a share of the profession, there are twice as many women flying US fighter planes as men teaching kindergarten. Now, to be clear, are there enough women flying fighter jets? I don't know. I do know that the US Air Force is redesigning the planes, redesigning the ejector seats, etc., to be more inclusive. 
so that more women are not barred by the physical stature and the shape of women not being what the ejector seats were designed for. So we're spending a lot of money to make sure that fighter jets work for women as well. Great. Actually, to be honest, I don't really care who's flying our fighter planes as long as I can shoot down the other fighter planes, <laughs> except to the extent that it might matter for career purposes. Where are the equivalent moves to make sure we're attracting men into teaching? Where are the equivalent investments? I've got to tell you, I've looked pretty hard and I can't find any. Although everyone seems to agree that it's a problem. I'm going to say a little bit about work and wages and a little bit about family, and then I'm going to stop with some solutions. I focus mostly on education. Uh, and Alice Evans, I think, will be great on this because uh, of her work around uh, economic relations. The key point here is that in advanced economies like the US, this is US data, we have seen a profound change in the economic position of women versus men. So the top chart here shows you the wage distributions of the women in orange and men in blue in 1979 and then in 2019. Okay. So what you can see is that in 1979, pretty different wage distributions, right? Ah, by 2019, not so much. In fact, by 2019, 40% of women earned more than the median man, compared to 13% of women in 1979. Now, if we had full gender equality in the labor market, it would be 50% of women earning more than the median man, because that's the middle of the distribution. But 40% is a lot more than 13%. This is a profound change in women's economic independence, women's economic power, and it is arguably the greatest economic liberation in human history. And one that we should all be immensely proud of. And I would like to see these go even further. But the idea that you change economic relations between men and women this profoundly, this quickly, without some dislocating consequences for the male role, as well as the female role, is very, very irresponsible thinking. These are massive changes in my lifetime. Blink of an eye, culturally speaking. And we are yet to come to terms with what they mean. The, the social conservatives of the 1970s warned that if women got economic independence from men, we'd be in real trouble because the men wouldn't know what to do with themselves and they would rampage around like Mad Max movie style burning everything inside. Actually, that hasn't happened, with ob obvious exceptions. Actually, violent crime rates have dropped. Actually, men aren't rampaging around Mad Max style. What are they doing? Hmm? They're retreating. Yeah. Um, some men are acting out, but mm, a lot more are checking out. And controversial thought for all our concerns about screens, video games, pornography, what would it be like if we didn't have them? Because the, in the 70s, we couldn't anticipate that. What, would be, what if there wasn't a basement to retreat to with porn and video games? What would the young men be doing then? I don't know, but I don't think we should assume that it would be something more pro-social. I told you it's controversial. I'll move quickly on. This shows you very briefly that wage inequality has risen significantly. As you saw from the last chart that the distribution shifted to the right as well. That's just telling us that people at the top have seen big wage gains, people at the bottom have not. Women across the board have seen wage gains, but especially at the top. So the top line is women at the top, the 80th percentile, followed by women in the median. These are the hatched lines of women, and the solid lines are men. Men at the top have also seen a bit of a wage gain. So men at the top are a little bit better off than men at the top were back in 79, or whenever my charts start, 79, right. But not true for most men. Median and below, less. So by 2018, 2019, most American men earned less than most American men earned in 1979. That's just a very blunt economic fact. And I think it has cultural consequences for how those men see themselves that perhaps those of us who spend our time at the top of these distributions don't pay enough attention to. We might be all about leaning in, but not very good at looking down. Maybe we're doing okay. That does not mean everybody else is doing okay. And again, let's intersect by race, and here I'm going to do black-white again. We've seen these wage gains, but white women have seen easily the biggest wage gains. 
So again, this is median 79 up to 2020. White men still at the top with some gains. White women, huge gains. Black men almost no gains, black women some gains. So there, white women now out earn black men by a huge margin, which was not true in 79. For every dollar earned by a white woman, a black man earns about 84 cents and a black woman about 80 cents. So again, we've got to think about this through the lens of both race and class at the same time. And recognize that for some groups, white college educated women especially, we've seen these massive economic gains. The other thing I'm just going to say, the last thing I'm going to say about employment, I've already mentioned the decline in the share of men in teaching. But here I've added from 80 up to 2020, the share of men, and this is prime age full-time workers for the economists in the room, the share of men in these other professions, psychology at the top, social work, elementary middle school teachers and registered nurses. Only nursing has seen any increase in male share. The others have seen a cratering in the male share, roughly halving. Psychology is becoming a female profession before our eyes, overnight almost. Among psychologists under the age of 30, only 5% are male. As you can see, that didn't used to be the case. I am as worried about male mental health as female mental health, and therefore as worried about our failure to have men in mental health care professions as to have women. Again, where are the campaigns? Where are the scholarships? What are we doing about these lines? Who's paying attention to these lines? We should be paying more attention to them if we're really, really worried about diversity of provision. I think I only have one chart on family. We can say more about this. But it's implied by what's everything that's gone before. We have dramatically altered the terms of trade economically between men and women. One thing that's happened is a significant share in the number of children being born outside marriage. Across the US now, 40% of children are born outside marriage. Roughly quadrupling since 1990, with a huge class gap. This shows you by the education of the mother in 1919, 2016, share of children born outside marriage. And what you can see is, among those with a four-year college degree, it's doubled, but it's doubled from five to 10. So it's still pretty unusual for college-educated women to have children outside marriage, but it's the norm for those with less education. We have this huge class gap in marriage now in the US, and especially huge class gap in who's having kids outside of marriage. The problem with that is that we have a legal system that presumes marriage, especially in the case of parental separation. And so while the divorce courts do a pretty good job of figuring that out, that is not true for unmarried parents. In most US states, the father has to prove paternity or the mother's trying to prove it to get child support. That's very often the reason they're trying to prove it. And the financial arrangements are entirely separate from access arrangements. The legal system is not designed for a world where almost half of our kids are born outside of marriage. And the people who tend to suffer most from that are the dads. Not always, but tends to be. So we have to update our view of marriage. Now, I said solutions, and I'm going to finish on some of these thoughts. What do we do about all of this? I'm not going to go through everything that's in the book, and I'm not going to go through everything that the Institute is working on. I'm happy to take questions on it. But number one, we should start boys in school a year later. They develop about a year later. Well, duh. Lots of private schools are already doing this. San Francisco has an extra year of pre-K for those who choose it. It does happen, but right now it happens for those who know about it and have the means, because that extra year can be costly. But as a prop policy proposition, why not? I would love to see us have more technical high schools. They really help boys. They seem to be neutral for girls. The evaluations are really strong. Only 7% of our high schools are technical high schools. Let's double that. That would be an extra 1,000. And they're very rare outside of Connecticut and Massachusetts. A million more apprenticeships. Why is the apprenticeship bill still stuck in the Senate? One reason, because 90% of apprentices are male. But given the skew in the mainstream system towards, towards women, is it terrible that apprenticeships seem to be a bit more appealing to men? I would argue now, no. Maybe that's a feature, not a bug. But we've got to do better. The US is the laggard in the OECD on apprenticeships. Generally speaking, vocational forms of learning tend on average can I just stop saying that now? Yes. <laughs> to favor boys. And so the underinvestment in alternatives to the traditional academic path is bad, period, but it's particularly bad for boys and young men. I think a reasonable proposition would be that we should have as many male teachers as we did when Ronald Reagan was president. One in three. How about that? We're at one in three college presidents are women now. We're going to be at 50% of college presidents are going to be women in the next decade. Hooray! Totally here for that. But what about, 
What about more men in our classrooms? And not only, by the way, because it seems like in subjects like English, where the boys are furthest behind, on average a grade level behind girls in English now, that having a male teacher helps, but also because male teachers in K-12 are much more likely to be after-school coaches, much more likely to be mentors, and we have a bit of a coaching deficit, particularly for poorer kids. So could we not do something as public policy with scholarships, marketing campaigns, etc.? I gave a talk at uh, some fraternities the other day, and I, I don't know what I think about fraternities, but I like this idea. One of the heads of the fraternity said, we're establishing some scholarships for fraternity brothers who want to go into teaching. Hooray. You know, you have to take your victories where you can. Uh, most, you, uh, most college campuses have a, have a women's resource center. There are only two colleges in the US that have a men's resource center. University of Oregon, Queensboro, maybe one in Ohio. That's it. Being male is the strongest risk for college dropout. Even here, with your eye-wateringly high graduation rates, congratulations, there is an eight percentage point gap between women and men in the four-year college graduation rate compared to the five-point gap between black and white students and the six-point gap between the Pell students and the, and the affluent students. Your gender gap in on-time college completion here is bigger than any other gap you record. So, and you're not alone. Everyone's doing that. So maybe it's time to be helping the men on college campuses because they are the biggest risk of dropping out. More scholarships get men to those heel jobs, health, education, administration, and literacy, and equal paid leave for fathers. I suggest outrageously six months paid leave for mums and dads. Outrageous. Since I wrote the book, the US military has introduced three months of paid leave. Three months for mums, three months for dads. Hooray. What about civilians? I don't know if these are the right ideas. I'd love your thoughts. I'd love more ideas. I'm in the foothills of all of this, but frankly, we're all in the foothills of this debate. We're only actually right now beginning to have a good faith, empirically based discussion about boys and men, but I will, I'll finish with this. If there are real problems in a society, like the problems that many boys and men are facing, and responsible people don't address them, irresponsible people will exploit them. The way to ensure that a problem becomes a grievance is to ignore it. And then sure as heck it will become a grievance, and then we have huge problems in our politics and our culture. So for me, this is existential. Not just because I'm a dad or a policy wonk, but because in the end, I think liberal democracy itself requires us to get away from zero-sum thinking and to recognize that a world of floundering men is unlikely to be one of flourishing women and that we have to rise together. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Chris Von Ruden, one of the organizers of this series. I'm an anthropologist. I'm a professor at the Jepson School. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and we'll run a QA. and uh, a There have been some questions submitted by some of you in advance. Uh, I've sort of distilled those, amalgamated them with some of my own thinking about your book. And so I have a few questions here. But then I will open it up for questions from all of you. Um, after a couple of questions here. So that's how we'll proceed. Um, so to start us off, um, I think you addressed in your book and just tonight how the sort of crisis for boys and men of color has long predated uh, the current uptick in, you know, it's especially acute and it's long predated the current uptick in concern about masculinity. Um, and, you know, would you say the current sort of focus on this uptick in, in concern about masculinity has been fueled by the issues plaguing especially less educated white men. You mentioned these, you know, um, uh, you know, crises of, you know, of health. Um, and, you know, so relatedly, how can we make sure that the policies you advocate are not going to end up advantaging that demographic, particularly at the expense of m boys and men of color? Right. So uh, I think this is back to the need to be intersectional about it. I talked about my book to my godson. You may notice that I am not a black American man. Um, I'm American now, and I'm a man. But, but my godson is African American, grew up in Baltimore in one of the toughest parts of Baltimore. And I started talking about these issues with him around the, I think, the very negative use of terms like toxic masculinity and these education gaps. And he looked at me, he's like, well, hello. Like, where have you been? Right? Um, and so I think to that extent, 
some, and, and also kind of the economic relationships between black men and black women, of course, lot, many of those trends predate all of this. So to that extent, I think it's a perfectly reasonable criticism to say, look, this is an issue that, that particularly affects black, as I said here, and I have a chapter on this, and you've got Charles Blow coming. But there are other issues that affect white men more, and there are other issues that affect working class men more, or rural men more. So it depends on the issue. And I think up until this point, there's been this sense, and even when my, President Obama did My Brother's Keeper, focused on black boys and men. I got some criticism, even though it was focused only on black boys and men. Um, and I, I'm afraid that if we don't signal to all boys and men that we're taking their problems seriously regardless of their race, whilst recognizing that they are different by race, then it will be seen in particular by white men or Asian men, men who are, who are not black, as, oh, well, that's for black men, that's not for me. And in the end, I think that has undermined the cause of trying to do more for boys and men. We've got to feel like this is something that's for everyone. And I, I don't think it will end up, I honestly believe that if you look hard at the problems of boys and men and you follow the data, the idea that you wouldn't be investing more in black boys and men is unthinkable. Right? You've only got to follow the data to say, well, in Michigan, 60% of black boys graduate high school on time. 60%? Compared to 75% of black girls? I just, like you, you can't look at the data and not come away from it thinking, yeah, we should focus on it. But I look at other data, as I've said, where I think, well, that seems to be affecting that group a bit more. So let's try to be empirical about it. That's my approach. I was thinking, you know, differential rates of incarceration mm -hmm. that are profound by, by race would affect the, the benefits of, say, family leave policies or um, sort of work subsidies or other things that, um, yeah. you know. That's right. But, I think that's a yeah. good example. Yeah. Okay. Um, Second question, so how can addressing the challenges for men contribute to a more supportive environment for women facing gender inequality, particularly the gender differences in unpaid labor in the home or otherwise, and obviously at the, you know, the upper echelons of business and politics remain dominated by men. Um, <laughs> so, I'll enjoy you. Right. Right, so how can I, all boats be okay, risen? Okay, so there's a few things here. So one is um, the fact that there are still many areas, especially at the top of society, where we clearly have a lot further to go in terms of women's representation. Um, it is, just should be front and center. 25% mm -hmm. of members of Congress are women. The US has yet to have a female president. Only 3% of venture capital money goes to female founders. Massive skew towards men in boardrooms. However, we have made huge progress on all those fronts, and we should do more, even in my lifetime. Right? I, it took me ages to realize that men could be prime minister in the UK uh, because I was born in 69, right? Um, but when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister, only 5% of MPs were women. Now it's more than a third. We've had three female prime ministers, and every political party in the UK except one is majority female. Right? I'm not saying with that. And in the US, we've seen big trends to, towards that mm -hmm. improvement. But I, I, it's back to this ability. Can we think two thoughts at once? Can we do two things at once? That's my invitation to people. Can we simultaneously say, wow, we've got to do more for women. I've called for quotas for women in, in, in Congress because I think representation there really matters. I'm really worried about that. I'm a bit, a bit ashamed of it, honestly, as a new American. Should we do that? Great. Boardrooms, are they still skewed hugely male? Yes, but last year, 45% of new board positions went to women, which is amazing and great. And Look at those suicide trends. Look at those education trends. Look at what's happening to lots of our boys and men. Am I worried about both of those? Yeah. And anybody who says, I'm only allowed to care about one of them is not our friend. Because they're inviting us to choose sides and only look at one half of the evidence. They're not telling the whole truth. So there's one side that will focus on all the issues that continue to face women and girls, quite rightly. You saw this in, in the pandemic in a major way. And then there's a bunch of other people, largely reactionaries, who are just focusing on all the problems of boys and men and blaming the women. What about both? What about taking both seriously? That's all I ask. OK. Uh, so in, in your book, you, you, you've mentioned again tonight that um, economic and social disadvantages hurt boys more than girls. Uh, and also, you know, a lot of education and workplace policy interventions in the past um, have tended to benefit inadvertently girls and women more than boys and men often. Yeah. Um, and you've mentioned this gender gap in motivation, mm -hmm. I think you did in your book. Mm -hmm. And that interests me because you look, you know, cross-culturally, 
um, you know, over history, you know, the status motivation among men is, it can be very profound. It's sort of motivation to mm -hmm. excel, to demonstrate oneself. Yeah. Uh, in, you know, you see that manifest in acts of heroism, in, uh, sometimes in extreme violence. Um, and so how do you reconcile that with this sort of maybe, what you maybe perceive as a gender gap in motivation in educational settings? When we know education is this clear route to status yeah. and earnings and romantic uh, opportunity among many other things. Well, um, it is. So the returns to education are similar for men as for women economically. So it's a bit of a mystery, and it is genuinely a mystery. Most people look at it and say, well, what's happening here? Why are men not responding as much to those economic incentives as women are? Um, it doesn't make immediate sense. But I think a couple of things are happening on one side or the, or the other. I think that the message to women for the last few decades has been get educated, get economically independent, get ahead. Right? There's been this very strong script of female empowerment, which has been very largely based around education and getting into the labor market and doing well. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's had profound effects. I really do. You see that. I walk around my own kid's high school, and there's all these posters about girls, you know, you know scholarships for girls, and you know, girls on the run, and girls who code, and you know, girl, you know, girl magic, and all that stuff, right? Which is great. Meanwhile, of course, the girls are just handing it to the boys at that school in terms of academic performance. So there's been this message, and my wife says that the message that her mum gave to her for all kinds of personal reasons as well as political ones, make sure you are never economically dependent on a man. Make sure you're economically independent. And by the way, the way to do that is to excel in education. And maybe to some extent there's this sense of like, because it still quotes a man's world, you've got to do even better. So there's a kind of immigrant mindset among a lot of women still, which is like, I've got to be even better, even I've got to work harder. So for whatever reason, just this massive motivational response on the part of women to these incentives. For men, it's less clear now what the incentive is. Are they going to be a breadwinner? Maybe not. Is education a source of high status for men? Maybe not. You see a big turn away from higher education among men now. I don't know what's happening to this idea of status among men, but it's clear that they're not as responsive to incentives. And I think it's because we have a very strong script for women, for girls and women now, which has replaced the old one. The old one was, get yourself, an, I'll horribly exaggerate, apologies, but you know, you'll be, I'm my mom. Right? Mm -hmm. She insisted on working. Her father's like, really? All right, nurse or teacher, I guess. So she was a nurse. Um, but the, but like, she was going to find a husband. And she was, that, that was going to be the relationship. That is not my generation's experience. And it's sure as hell not the generation, the experience of my sons. So we've torn up the old scripts for the male and female roles. We've replaced the old female script with a very empowering and positive one. And we've replaced the male script, the old one, of like, you're going to be a breadwinner, you're going to be a head of household, you need to earn more so that you can take care of your you know, wife and children. We've torn that one up and replaced it with nothing. And into that vacuum, poor the online men. They will fill the vacuum if we don't. It seems to keep teetering on discussion of populism and demagoguery and manipulation of yeah. Young, yeah. Well, it's back to this reaction. I mean, yeah. you know, where men are struggling most, reactionary politics is strongest. That seems to be just borne out by the literature. Yeah. Let's open it up um, to questions now. Um, so I guess, should I just call? And we'll start in the, in the front. Oh, we got microphones. Oh, Yeah, my, my friend just said it's like we're on Oprah. Um, so I'm, I, was, I was in my mind conflating your slides um, regarding suicide and family life. And I'm interested in maybe thinking about those in terms of relationship formation and specifically adult relationship formation of men with other men and certainly women as well. If you could elaborate on that, are you seeing that as a, as a seed of research? Um, is that related to the mental health issue and having men in you know, mental health professions to help facilitate that? I, just if you could unpack that a little bit, I, I'd yeah, be interested sure. to hear more. Well, I'll give a shout out first to a piece I just wrote for Comment uh, magazine on relational masculinity. I use my own father as an example. Uh, so I contrast lone ranger masculinity go your own way, be your own man, with relational masculinity. And I think masculinity properly defined is more relational. It's more about what you're doing for others, serving others, generating a surplus of whatever it is. Um, and so if men don't feel like relationally embedded 
and they don't feel needed, they don't feel that there's a particular role for them, I think they are at particular danger of falling away. Uh, I've come to believe that the male role has to be somewhat more socialized, perhaps even than the female one. There's a quote from Margaret Mead, anthropologist, not entirely uncontroversial, but, and she said, but I do like this from her, she said, every known human society has rested on the learned, nurturing behavior of men. This behavior being learned is rather fragile and that can disappear very quickly under circumstances that no longer teach it effectively. And I believe every word of that sentence. Learned nurturing behavior. And so I think that sense of like, do men, are men needed and are they in relationships? It's why I think the sort of friendship crisis among men also matters. Because although I, we've talked about family and that sense of being needed by the family, there's also friends and so on too. And 15% of young men now say they don't have a close friend, which was 3% in 1990. And so just that sense of like uh, the, 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 the disrelationship, the deinstitutionalization of masculinity, I think lies at the root of some of these problems. Marriage. Marriage. Yeah, marriage is giving, I mean, actually it's interesting that in surveys now, men are more likely to say that marriage is important to them than women. Those men are right. <laughs> men without wives typically aren't great. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's true. Over here. Yes. So I remember earlier, um, before you opened it for Q&A, you were talking about where did, our, where did men's motivation go in the modern day and why, even though higher education is usually a predictor of success, money, and status in later life, how come men aren't motivated to do that? I think, um, as somebody who is a young dude, I think I have an idea of what, where that motivation could be going. So why would you, as a young man, why would you attempt to become famous or have high status in your later life or get a lot of money when in a video game you can be the best player and get the most amount of points and whatever it is? Why would you do that in real life when it's hard and you gotta do hard work and you gotta put the work in when you can do that in, I don't know, maybe a few months in a video game while sitting at a desk? Why would you attempt to have a family and have a relationship with a woman, with a woman when you can do all that stuff online in ways that I'm not going to say because I'm not comfortable saying it. And <laughs> why would you, as a young man, why would you try to find brotherhood? Why, were you, why would you try to find friendship or stuff like that when you can fight with your friends in Call of Duty and like talk to each other like your brothers on a battlefield? Why would you need to find real life brotherhood when you can do that online? And I'm not saying any of those are good reasons to do it. They're by no means good reasons. But I think that is where a lot of male motivation is being drained to, being driven to. Um, especially when you're on TikTok all day or Instagram all day, that drains you a lot. How are you gonna find motivation to get up and do the hard work, whether that be pursue your business passion or try to improve yourself physically or do any of that, when you're draining yourself on things like video games, content that is bad for you online <laughs> or um, TikTok or Instagram, why, why would you do the, um, do the hard work to get those benefits in real life when you can get them in a video game or online much, much easier? I think that's a big part of where our motivation is going. Um, did they have a question? No, I think, I, I just think, <laughs> I wanna, I, I think I have a answer, or an answer to the question of why or yeah. where our motivation is going. Well, and that that, was, that's my two salts. That was, um, that was the most brilliant answer to your own question I could imagine giving. <laughs> but I will say one more thing, which is, look, I mean, I, I put out the provocative thesis that like, what's the counterfactual here, right? If men didn't have those alternatives, would things be better? Maybe. Maybe they'd be worse. I don't know. Um, the way I think about those sorts of activities, which you, you were reluctant to name, um, but I'll say, like video games and pornography, right? The fact of like, like high quality online pornography is just a massive cultural fact, right? This is just like, you know, a typical young man can see sort of more you know, naked female flesh in three minutes online than the average man probably saw in his lifetime, not that long ago, right? 
I mean, it's just, and, and this is a cultural shock of a magnitude I think we haven't got our head around. Now, I looked very hard for the evidence of harm from these things, and I don't find much direct evidence for harm, except for those people who get addicted, which is true for lots of things. What I do find is that it's displacing other activities. So, what, it's actually girls are on TikTok more than boys. In, girls are on Instagram, the boys are on Discord playing games. And actually, so the direct harm from social media on girls I think is clearer. For men, I think it's more of a, dis, it's a dislocation effect. It's like it's somewhere to go. So then the alternative is like, what's the alternative to that, right? I don't mind my sons playing video games, but I would mind if they weren't going out with their friends and playing sport and doing other stuff, right? So as part of a, a life, is it fine? But what's the motivation to do those other things? If you don't feel like someone's relying on you, needs you, there's a future for you. And the other thing is back to that chart, like that prefrontal cortex thing, one of the things that happens is the idea of future orientation. Right? And just, it just takes longer for guys to start imagining their future self and thinking, oh, maybe I should think about my 30-year-old self who might actually have a family, who might need a dad, who isn't only really good at you know, Siege or Call of Duty or whatever. Um, but that is a very distant figure. And so we need rites of passage and scripts that get us there even when our 17-year-old self is like, wait, what, 30? I'll be dead by then, right? I mean, just like, you can't, you can't imagine yourself at 30. And so what good societies do is they find ways to socialize us into doing the hard things, even when the immediate return is not obvious. And I just think a lot of that's fallen away for men, certainly by comparison to women, and they're, being, they're doing so badly in school by comparison to girls, especially like working class kids, by the way. Like the, the gap in college going at the top is like 5%, in the middle it's 13%, at the bottom it's 16%, right? So this is very much a class story too. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned how you didn't expect to see yourself take this um, route in life and how your peers didn't. So how did you end up doing what you're doing and um, going around telling people and explaining your data? Um, it's, really, it's quite hard to answer this question without either being you know, incredibly vulnerable or incredibly self-congratulatory or some awful combination of the two. <laughs> um, honestly, what happened was that the more people that said, look, you can't, you can't do that. You'll just be, you know, you'll, be you'll be pushed off to the right, et cetera. And I have seen that happen to lots of books and lots of authors, by the way, because it's just the dynamic is so polarizing. Our media is so polarized. Our think tanks are polarized, our politics are polarized, we're all these kind of, that it's really, really hard to not just get sucked into one bubble or the other, right? And so they just assume, you come out with a book on boys and men, you get sucked into that bubble, right? Into the kind of more reactionary, conservative bubble. It's just no avoiding it. That's the, like a law of gravity. And what I really came to believe was, look, if that's even half true, how do we stop that being true? Because it's the very definition of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If boring people, at boring institutions, like the Brookings Institution, with boring charts, don't talk about this issue, then other boring people, like politicians, <laughs> won't want to talk about it either. So we're all basically silencing ourselves. And you've just got to move. You've just got to, you've just got to do it. And the truth is, if, as long as you do it in the right way, and I felt like I could do it in the right spirit. So my wife describes me as the worst of all possible worlds, a thin-skinned polemicist. <laughs> this is not a polemic, very deliberately. But, it, but I want to be clear, this is not out of some sense of I like being attacked, I like people being upset with what I'm saying, etc. I don't. I really don't like that. I take it very personally, too personally. But at the same time, I think that means that I'm quite sensitive about the way I try to express it. And I try to be thoughtful and empirical about it. So I just felt like I had a role. And I honestly feel like, given some of these trends, I just felt a responsibility um, to just try and do something to move the debate on a little bit. I felt I had some skills that might help that. And in the end, I just felt like I didn't have any choice. Like, what's the point of being the kind of person I am if I'm not willing to take a few risks? Like, if not me, then who's going to do that? So, and my wife looked me in the eye and said, oh, for goodness sake, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> In the back? Sure. Yeah. No. There's somebody in the back, I think. I think, I think there are some other dimensions to what you've been describing that you may have covered in your book. I don't know, but um, uh, 
YouTube person who calls himself Shoe on Head that you probably haven't heard of did a program just a couple of weeks ago about male loneliness and she got an overwhelming negative reaction from women about saying that. Now, okay, she, in her expression about it, um, you know, she said, well, sure, we talk about other things, but that was what I was talking about on that occasion. But um, what she expressed, and I don't know her numbers, but was just a tremendous reaction from women of boo-hoo, <laughs> basically. And I think that part of the uh, frustration of men as they are at least not at the highest levels but in the middle levels and below they're kind of falling behind um, financially and academically uh, um, on a kind of a steady basis and so and um, listening to Stefan Molyneux talking about how a very large percentage of women pursue the higher quality men, which increases the level of frustration that occurs in the middle ground. And I don't know if you've addressed that in your book, but I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. So I addressed it a little bit. Um, Carol Hooven will be good on that. Um, but I think this whole idea of Joe Henrik, who's a colleague of Carol's, calls it the math problem of surplus men. Right. One of the most astonishing facts I came across was that we have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. Because throughout, if you take the whole of human history, men have only had about a 50-50 chance of reproducing, whereas almost all women have reproduced. So twice as many human ancestors are female as male. And that explains a lot about risk taking, etc. But also 95% of known human societies have been polygamous, largely polygynous, in other words, men having multiple wives or multiple partners which means you have the math problem of surplus men. We are a very long way from that point. But it does speak a bit to this point about status. Men do care about status, for sure. So do women, but in a slightly different way. Um, so I address it a little bit, but a little bit tangentially. And what I'll say about the, loan, the, the friendship, I don't know that, that um, particular YouTuber. Um, you said that there was like boo-hoo. I have to tell you that my experience of this issue is that if you present it honestly and try to be faithful to the data and you continue to point out that there are obviously still issues facing women and men, I gotta tell you, there aren't many women out there who think it's good if men are suffering. And I think it's close to a slur that we use. I'm not saying you did it. But if there are a handful of online activists, and I've encountered a few who do the boo-hoo thing, we shouldn't let them dominate the debate. We should let the hundreds and thousands of mums and wives and sisters and women who are worried about the men in their lives as well as the women in their lives and listen to them instead. This whole idea that there's this kind of zero something, it's against, that has not been my, by and large, my experience. I think most women, as it turns out, care about men and boys. And that to suggest otherwise is very unhelpful to the debate. I'm sorry she had that experience. But if I was her, I would say, don't let those few people online be representative of that. That would be like saying Andrew Tate is representative of the views of men, right? <laughs> um, and we've just all got to have a bit more generosity. And most importantly, Ezra Klein said this in my podcast, uh, in the podcast I did with him. He said, part of the problem here is there's this view that, that, that compassion is like a fixed good. There's only so much compassion to go around. And so by showing more compassion to the problems of boys and men, we're using up compassion. That's not how compassion works. It's not how love works either. It's not restricted. And just as, you know, just because you love one child doesn't mean you can love the other one less. And just because we care about boys and men doesn't mean we care about women and girls any less. And we all need to move beyond that. That's stale thinking. We rise together.